Hello and welcome to the Indie Beginning Podcast. Every so often, the Lord of Calendars brings us a bonus one day, which allows us to bring you a bonus episode. We thought it would be nice to do a recap of our author interviews. Music found in this episode comes from our friend Elto Key. Elto Key is a British indie folk artist created by singer-songwriter Kean Barton. Barton composes each song at home in Bath and works with musicians around the world to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Each song found in this episode comes from their Animals EP and can be found on Spotify. We'll include a link in our show notes. Stick around after the episode and we'll play my favorite song by this band in full. We have found our featured authors to be encouraging as well as full of unique and useful knowledge. Recently we spoke to the author of Brind, a Regency romance, M. Pepper Longlinase, about genres and whether you should choose one for your writing career or branch out and write for whatever story comes to mind. Here's her conversation with Marie. What drew you to the Regency subgenre of romance? Well, I've been reading Regency romance for a really long time, since I was a preteen, really. Um, It was the only kind of romance I was allowed to read growing up in a religious household. And I don't know what took me so long to decide to write a Regency romance, considering how much I enjoy reading them. Um, But I've always been drawn to that era and the fun banter that tends to be written into those stories and all the different, you know, titles and the gowns and the parties. For me, that's just a lot of fun to read and a lot of fun to write. Did you find it difficult writing in the Regency subgenre? A recent blog post I read by Maggie McKeever stated, just like the polite society of the era, Regency romances involve lots of rules, too many. To my way of thinking. I was wondering if you felt some of the rules hindered story flow or if Brind may have changed from your original concept because of such rules. You know, I think it was probably a lot harder to write in the Regency genre before the internet when you could look up all these rules and, uh, you know, the titles and all the information, sort of having it at your fingertips. Um, I also have a book called What Jane Austen Ate and Charles Dickens Knew, and that's been a really good resource. Um, There are a lot of rules. I mean, that society had a lot of rules. And like I said, that that was probably a lot harder to write before I could look it all up online. And I know some of that information online is probably still questionable. I try to be sure I'm using really good sources. Um... But I do remember when writing Brindy, uh, I got about halfway through the manuscript and realized I had all the forms of address wrong and I had to go back and change the way people were, were addressing one another. That was, that was quite a chore, but I was glad to get it right in the end, or I think I did, I hope I did, because uh, I know readers are, can be you know sticklers for that. I read on your blog that you love writing in multiple genres. And you have books available on Amazon ranging from mystery thrillers to romance. Has this affected your writing career or your author brand? Do you feel that you lose fans from one genre to the next? Oh my God, this is such a fight between me and my husband, who's also my manager. He's in marketing and um, he's like, pick a genre and stick with it. You can't build an audience the way you skip around. But I get, I get bored writing the same kind of thing over and over. And I I like to read so many different kinds of books, which makes me want to write a lot of different kinds of books. And uh, and that's probably hurt my ability to keep readers, I I admit it. But that was a decision that I consciously made. I, you know, I was like, I could keep doing this. My my Sherlock Holmes stories did very well for me, and I could could have kept writing them but, um, you know, when you, you, you feel like you're kind of dried up on that, you don't want to just churn things out for the sake of churning them out. So, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, well, I'll write this thing. I'll write that thing. I do think with Regency Romance, though, I may have found my genre because I really, really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun to write. And it's, I, I don't want to say writing is ever easy, but for me, it, it flows more readily. Um, and so I'm working on another one now, and I'm hoping that people who enjoyed Brindy will like Faeburn when it's done, too. Do you have a preferred genre, one that you are most comfortable writing? 
Well, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I think Regency romance may be my genre at this point. I, it's definitely the one I have the most fun writing. I think it's the easiest to write because it feels like a lot less pressure when I'm writing it. Um, despite the need for the research and the detail, I feel it's just, uh, it flows better for me. And so that one at this point is probably the genre that I'm happiest writing. Um, I still enjoy mystery. I still enjoy fantasy. The The Regency romance I'm writing now has a touch of fantasy to it. But um, I think Regency romance is probably my genre now. If you could go back in time and tell your early writing self one thing, what would that be? I think I would tell myself not to lose the love of writing. I think early on, I wrote because I enjoyed it. I wrote for me and uh, would foist my work upon my friends, but it was never with this idea of publishing or being successful particularly, um, or I, I don't know, I guess I just, yes, I wanted eventually to be an author, but I don't think I had thought that much about the 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 end result so much as just writing for the joy of it. And now it's so much easier to think, oh, but will this sell? And to get wrapped up in the marketing and the selling and worrying about reviews and whether or not people will like it. And then you, you cease to really enjoy the actual writing process part, the stories. Um, and I think that's something I keep having to remind myself of and something that I would write to myself earlier say don't worry about that worry about whether or not you're enjoying it because at the end of the day this is how you're spending your time this is how you're spending your life uh, and you should enjoy it enjoy what you do that's such important advice for anybody in any field so now that you figured out your subgenre do you jump right in and begin putting fingers to keys and right away or sit back and take some time to brainstorm an outline. Scott Stevens, author of On Ice, has his own thoughts about outlining. You mentioned that you don't use outlines when writing. What do you think started this? I created an outline for On Ice, but as I started writing the story, the more it continued, the more it unfolded, the further away from the original outline it got. That didn't necessarily mean it was bad. Uh, actually, it was quite better. So as the story continued forward, I got further and further away from the outline I had. That didn't mean the story itself, as far as the plot goes, changed. But the things that led up to it, the details, things like that, um, were actually better. So I ended up getting away from the outline completely. I learned from that, and for Twister Town, I didn't do an outline at all. By the time On Ice was finished, I, the outline was completely trashed. I, I hadn't looked at it probably over the last half of the book. I, di I do keep a list of characters close by with their details and all that stuff so I can you know, refer to it when I need to. But as far as an outline goes, I, I don't even bother anymore because it, it's uh, it, it, things change as the story unfolds and I really don't see the need for doing it. So he started an outline and then drifted away. Have you ever tried to outline? Uh, the most I do with outlining is if I come up with a sentence that I absolutely want to have somewhere in there, I'll write it down and then it sits in a drawer until I find a spot for it. Yeah, see, I'd rather have the extra, the extra notes and then come back to them in a couple of years. Can you think of any advantages or disadvantages to not outlining your stories? <laughs> There's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to not using an outline when you're writing a story. Um, the advantage is obviously you're you're free to go wherever you want with the story. Um, if if you write an outline and you're not you know contractually obligated to somebody, you're always free to move away from your your original outline anyway. But um, you know if you don't have one, you're free to just let your mind do the work for you and let it flow through your fingers. The disadvantage to not having an outline. They probably far outweigh the advantages because it, it's very easy to forget things. If you take a break from writing a week, two weeks, you know, what have you, um, when you come back, 
Sometimes you might forget what happened. Once you hit chapter 40, you might forget what happened in chapter 10. And it's very easy to do that. And that's where your editing process is very, very important. Because I've, I've gone back. It happened in On Ice. It happened in Twister Town. I went back and saw some, some things that I had changed as the story progressed. And I didn't realize that it had changed because of not using an outline. Um, it, it's not a bad thing. You just have to be very careful and pay very close attention when you're editing. Um, because you don't want to have that huge glaring error in the middle of your story that everybody's going to read. Do you still use notes? For example, if you have something you must have in a story, an idea, a phrase, an action, do you have it somewhere so that you know you make sure it gets put into your writing? Yeah, I, I still use notes. and I, I take notes continually as I write the story. Um, I do my work in Word documents. So as I'm writing, when I come up with ideas... Um, you know, for the future, I write them at the bottom in, in probably like a footnote format um, underneath what I'm currently writing. And I do this so it's constantly there. I know what's going to happen um, and I won't forget it. If I'm working on chapter three, as I'm working on chapter three, I get the idea of what I want to do in chapter four, five and six. I write those notes right below that. Sometimes I'll get, you know, out of chapter three, I'll, something will come to me that I want to happen in chapter 27. And I write those notes, you know, right below there. So, um, I, I don't know if you want to consider it a guideline or not, but as the story unfolds, I do take notes, you know, so I don't forget. Um, before the starting the story, obviously you get an idea from something, um, what I do instead of sitting down and writing out your outline and, you know, with the details and stuff, I just think about it for two, three, four weeks. I have the basic idea and I, I just think about it as I'm going through everyday life. And when I feel comfortable that I have the storyline that I want and it's complete, then I sit down and I start to write and, and let it, let my mind do, you know, the work. Uh, for instance, Twister Town came to me in a dream. I woke up one morning and, and remembered I had dreamed the plot of Twister Town, you know, the night before. I thought it out two to three weeks and came up with the storyline and the basic characters that I wanted. And I did all that before I sat down to actually start writing it. That's my worst fear. Just forgetting. I have that berry brain. And I'm sorry to everybody who's not in my family, but if you are, you understand the metaphor. There's so many times that I come up with a great idea and lose it because I can't reach for my phone or write something down. I'm a truck driver, so I'll spend six hours a week just driving in one direction. I can't take notes. I can't even grab my phone to hit my recorder. I mean, I, it's just not a safe way to, to drive. So lots of times I, I, I forget what I wanted to do in my writing. Yeah, and I'll take notes that way i mean like acn is for a four book series and i can't possibly at all times remember what happened in book one to put incorporate it into book four so i might write down one or two sentences just to refresh my memory yeah that's all i need i, I just need to be able to i should probably look into that voice activated thing on my phone but it never works do you feel that freestyle writing changes character development or plot as opposed to, say, outline story writing does? Do I feel that it changes plot development? It, it does. Um, absolutely it does, but for the better. You know, as, as you go along, you come up with better ideas. Experience in life is everything. Writing is the same thing. Writing a good fiction story, it's exactly the same thing. The more experience you have, the more involved you get into your story, the better the ideas that you get. As the characters unfold, the story un unfolds, um, you'll get better ideas of what you want to do, what works better in certain situations. Um, so I, I think it, it actually helps development because everything is free and anything can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, I'm, I'm working on The Gardener, for instance. Um, I, I currently, I'm uh, chapter 27, 28, 29, something like that, in The Gardener. Now, what I have here is Detective Evan Burke, who's the, the main character. He's investigating a murder. I know who, who has been murdered, but I don't know who did it. Uh, I'm in chapter 27, and I still don't know who did it. All that will work itself out. I have a couple of ideas. You know, there's a couple of characters that have already been introduced 
Um, that could be the guilty party. But as the story unfolds, the story will tell me who did it. I won't tell the story, if, if that makes any sense. Um, as everything unfolds, and, and that is, I think, the, the great thing of doing it the way I do it, character and plot development unfolds itself. I don't necessarily have to know as I tell the story and everything continues to move forward, the story will dictate to me, you know, the development that it follows and who did it, who didn't do it, you know, and, and so on. Do you have any advice for indie authors? What have you learned from your writing adventure that you'd like to pass on for those beginning their journey? What advice do I have for indie authors? <laughs> Quit now. Quit while you're ahead. No, I'm I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's hard. You have to know that it's a hard, frustrating road. Don't think for a single minute that it's not. You know, I I never thought when I was writing on ice, I never thought that the easiest part of the equation was going to be actually writing the book. I thought that was going to be the hardest part. I, I was so wrong. I was so ignorant to everything that went on and, and takes place in the the book world, you know, in the publishing world, it, it, it's crazy. Um, you, you have to prepare for a very long and frustrating road. You have to have a lot of patience. Um, y you can't rely on other people to do your stuff for you. Nobody's going to do things the way you want them to. Nobody's going to do things in the time frame that you want them to. Nothing is going to happen overnight. The only time that's ever going to happen is if you're lucky enough to hook up with a um, legitimate literary agency or a legitimate publishing company. They will do stuff for you. Uh, nobody else will. You have to do it on your own. I do all of my own promotions, engagements, appearances, book signings, everything. I'm, I'm my own agent. And it leads to a lot of frustration. You just have to be persistent and you have to be patient. Uh, that, I mean, that's really all there is to it. Don't expect something to happen overnight because there's no way that that's just not going to happen. Uh, everything is a very slow, methodical process. Um, if you can accept that, you know, you'll be okay. Uh, you also have to make good contacts and friends uh, within the business. Jamie Engel is a, a good friend of mine. She wrote the uh, Clifton Chase and the Arrow of Light, the Dredge. Uh, she also wrote the, the Toilet Papers. Um, I, I talked to her a lot. Um, we bounce ideas off each other. We share information. We share contacts. Um, it, it's good to have someone else in the business who's dealing with the same things you are. She's further along in the process than I am. Uh, she has you know more books out, but she's also an independent author, and she deals with the exact same things. Um, so it's it's good to have somebody that you can talk to, and I mean sharing contacts and ideas and information is is very very important. Um, you know, she's introduced me to a lot of people. Uh, I've I've introduced her to some people that I knew. Um, you know, that constant respect among fellow authors is very important, and you'll learn a lot of things, and it will help you with your process in getting your books out in front of the you know people that you want. The main thing is just prepare for a long haul and accept the fact that it's it's not going to be easy. You're not going to get instant results, but if you're persistent and you don't give up. Um, you know, you, you can get it done. Um, but it's just promotion, promotion, promotion. That's, that's the biggest thing. Um, do that, take care of your own stuff. Um, and don't give up. That's the thing. If you want it, uh, if you want your story to be out there, if you want people to read it, um, and you want to get it in, in front of as many people as you can, patience and persistence that, I mean, that's it. That's all I can say. It's, it's a, you're going to have a lot of frustrations expect that and as long as you expect it and you can accept that you know you'll be fine so just just don't give up that's that's the the biggest thing that that i have to say and be persistent follow up on anything that you have if you talk to somebody and they tell you they're gonna get back to you in two weeks you don't hear back from them in in two weeks give them an extra week and then get back to them don't be afraid to follow up with people you know put in the work and um you know you never know good things may happen never give up Many times as authors, you're told to wait for a response. But advocate for yourself. Be persistent in your dream. As Scott said, he doesn't use outlines. He likes to sit down and allow the story to take over. Paul Grover, on the other hand, has to take notes and brainstorm. 
As the author of the science fiction novel Ark of Souls, he must create worlds, life forms, economies. He must think of details for his creations that may never even see the paper. Listen to Paul explain his world building process. As an author of science fiction, world building plays an important part in your story. Everything from spaceships, future mechanics, to even planets and their ecosystems must be dreamed up by you. So here's a chicken or the egg question. Which came first? Do you have a story in mind and then world build around it or vice versa? Or does each one mold the other? Uh, for me, it, they tend to work hand in hand. I've usually got an idea of what my world's going to be like in advance. So I'll work out roughly what the aesthetic of the world is, uh, the nature of the universe. Is it a utopian society or a dystopian one? Does everything work or is everything a little bit run down? Um, I'll have an idea of the system of governance and how society is organised. But aside from that, I'll kind of conjure each scene as I go along. So um, I'll identify what a scene needs, what it needs to um, get from point A to point B, and what features of the world I want to draw on and illustrate within the scene. Once I've done that, I will generally make a note of what I've produced and how I've produced it. So um, if I ever return back to it at a later date, uh, I've got that data to call on. What major writing dilemmas or roadblocks have you come across during your world building process? How did you overcome this struggle? Yeah, I think when you build complicated worlds, you inevitably build traps for yourself. It's an occupational hazard of world building. Um, I think good planning can actually alleviate some of that and some advanced building can can help with that. Um, But it's often the small details that catch you out. So, for example, you have a a planetary system, you work out what colour the star is, you work out how many planets there are, you work out the name of the habitable one and what the habitable one's climate's like, Uh, you work out uh, where resources come from and what jobs people do, and you have your characters arrive there, they jump off their starship and they go and buy coffee. And they can't buy their coffee because you haven't actually worked out how the galactic economy works. Uh, do the Does the money they have in their pockets, is it universal or do they have to change to a local currency? Is money even a feature of your universe? So it's, it's little things like that that you have to consider. And I, I know it's a slightly contrived example, um, but certainly the type of thing I would fall victim of in Ark of Souls uh, was uh, communication distances and inconsistencies creeping in due to time lag between sending a message and a message arriving so quite often i'd send a message from earth and even with faster than light communications it would take two weeks to arrive at the frontier Um, in the time it's been traveling the person it's meant for has already set off on the mission that they're being asked to do so you know what i'll do at first draft stage is go back and um, reassess all of those problems and take them out if necessary I'm glad that you brought up traps. Throughout the internet, there are lists of the deadly sins of science fiction world building. That include themes like basing a distant planet too much on Earth or creating beings that are too human like. Have you ever found yourself falling into one of these world building traps? I've read many of these lists over the years and I've lost a lot of sleep over them. But I've kind of come to the conclusion now that um, they really are just guidelines. Um, They're not rules, they're not set in stone. And the reason being, if your story is strong enough and you can come up with a credible explanation for something, there's no reason why you shouldn't ignore those rules, um, you know, tear them up and shred them if you need to. Uh, to give you a couple of examples of that, of that I'd like to talk about the um, idea of Earth-like planets and human-like aliens. In Ark of Souls, we have many Earth-like planets. The reason being that... Um, I think if humans were to make it into space, they're going to seek out worlds that are similar to our own, simply because they make for the most comfortable living environment. Um, A planet with similar gravity and similar atmosphere is going to be much more enjoyable to live on than, say, the planet from Alien, uh, which seems quite unpleasant, to be fair. Uh, so I think you know humans are going to naturally seek out the, the best option for them. And you know, why would they bother terraforming rocky worlds if they could live on a, um, a, a sort of a tropical paradise? So that takes me into the idea of you know alien species and, and what they're going to be like and why would they necessarily be like us. Um, we've evolved in such a way that uh, we can exploit the Earth's environment to our maximum advantage. So, you know, walking upright and having binocular vision has allowed us to um, basically carry a bigger brain around, get more input and kind of influence the world around us. Having opposable thumbs and the brain power to work out what to do with them allows us to use tools, drive cars and play Call of Duty. So, 
we are perfectly well adapted for, for where we live. Now, an assumption that I'm making in, in a lot of the Arca Souls universe is that um, aliens growing up under similar conditions, they may have evolved from reptiles or even insects or, or another kind of base species. But under similar conditions, it seems kind of logical that they may walk on their hind legs. They may have opposable thumbs. They may have two arms and two eyes, just like we do. Where they would differ is in the, their mindset and their, their outlook on the world. Who's to say they would have the same ethics, the same morals, or the same societal structure of us? I think if you map those kind of things onto an alien species, then you're getting into trouble. Um, but I think you can still have a relatable kind of humanoid alien um, who displays an entirely different value set. And I think that that kind of adds a little bit of uh, conflict into the story as well, because you've kind of, well, they, they look like us, but they don't think like us. So I think that's kind of an interesting uh, way to pursue that. But I think overall, um, you have to kind of make your choices and you have to kind of justify them. If your story can carry it, don't worry about breaking anyone's rules. In his post titled Against World Building on the Electric Literature website, Lincoln Michelle discusses world building versus world conjuring. His distinction is that world building attempts to create every little detail from the exact moment people wake up to currency exchange rates and so on, while, and I quote, world conjuring does not attempt to construct a scale model in the reader's bedroom. World conjuring uses hints and literary magic to create the illusion of a world, with the reader working to fill in the gaps. World building imposes, world conjuring collaborates. What are your thoughts on this? I definitely do both. And I I like the idea of having a sort of a firm, solid touchstone in which you go to, to, to refer to for broad brush elements of the world. But I kind of also like the idea of discovering the world as the characters do. Um, I think that's important as a writer because it makes it very interesting to, to actually write a scene and build the world as you go through it because you're, you're you're making the discoveries at the same time as a character so sometimes you know you can impart their se- your sense of wonder into them and it it kind of makes it much more immediate and i also think readers respond to that as well because they they're discovering the world at the same time as your characters are as well so it's like they're looking over their shoulder um, I think it's important once you've done that, though, to kind of keep everything documented. So once you've created a scene to sort of sit back, look through it and actually see what you've put in it to make sure it's consistent with your overview of the world, to make sure it's consistent with your previous scenes and to make sure that you can use it again at a later date. So I've got a, a database on my system. I constantly am updating with new facts about the world, uh, little features about different locations and that type of thing. So I think Conjuring's great. And I, I kind of think of it a little bit like uh, building a film set. So we've got a scene that we need our characters to move through. So we build a set for them to interact with. Uh, they interact with it and they move on to the next scene. So we, we build the set for that as we go. Um, what we're hoping is that the reader and to some extent maybe the characters don't take a little peek behind the back and see all the scaffolding that's holding it together. So, Paul, if you found yourself miraculously transported back through time and were sitting with your early writing self, what is the one piece of writing wisdom that you would impart? If I could go back in time and have a word myself, I think the the thing I would probably be most keen to impress upon my, my early writing self would be not to work in secret. Uh, I probably spent a good 18 months of development on Ark of Souls, uh, sitting up late at night, typing away, and no one had a clue what I was doing. Um, I think my wife found out after, after about two years that I didn't actually have a sleep disorder. I was actually writing a book. And the, the problem I had, you know, there was times you just feel so isolated and cut off. And actually, when you open up and you show people what you're doing, you start getting some feedback. You get a feel for what's right and what's not so right. Um, And you kind of you start to feel your confidence grow. And then subsequently, having published Ark of Souls, I've discovered the the wonderful thing that is the indie community. Uh, Other writers have been so supportive, uh, so helpful, so giving of advice and so inspirational. And it's great to to get out and meet those people. I, I so wish I'd done that sooner. Um, because at times I'll be sitting at the, at, at the keyboard, banging my head on the desk, thinking this doesn't work. I'm going to give it all up and go and live in Tibet as a goat. And you can just jump onto social media and just fire off a post and someone will come back and say, try doing this. And you're like, that worked. And so being able to do that is fantastic. So I tell myself not to lock myself in a room, um, treat writing as a social thing 
not an isolating thing. There's one other bit of advice I would give myself, and that would be drink more coffee and get a really good coffee machine because as a writer, you're actually going to need it. Let people in on your writing. We can't learn and grow as artists without feedback. Often humans are simply afraid of rejection or take criticism too personally. You have created something that you love and are afraid that others won't like it. But you need the feedback. You need the feedback to understand what your audience likes. You write for them as well. Recently, we spoke to my co-host and author, Marie Kammerer Frankie, about her first novel, A Charming Nightmare. And due to money worries, she published without using an editor. This is what she had to say. And that was really an important, um, that was something that you have, you shouldn't sacrifice, but I kind of did for cost-wise. I didn't want to go broke or take out loans or whatever to afford an editor. Um, so I relied on family and friends to do that. And uh, as the writer, until Carmela had pointed out some of these, in my mind when I read it, my mind changed it so that it was correct, even though it's still written wrong. Um, there's also a part in the book where instead of writing closest, I write closets. And my mind keeps switching it so it never got corrected. Yeah, this topic brings me to uh, my top two indie author editing dilemmas. One being cost and the other being self-editing because of cost. Right now, if you go online, you can find copy editing proofreading from like one cent a word to two cent a word, you know, depending on what you want. But it can go up to as much as $85 an hour. I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars. And if, if you're going without a, a publisher, as, as indie authors do, and agents... I mean, thousands of dollars, or it's just thousands of dollars you don't have. You're already working and you're sacrificing hours at work so that you could get your art uh, created. You're excited to get your work out there, but, but you don't have the money. And after years of trying to publish mainstream, quotes in the air, you decide to go indie. Here's where investing in yourself comes into play. And that's what it is. You're investing in yourself, your work. You're not simply paying a fee to an editor. Take on a second seasonal job. Start a GoFundMe campaign. Ask somebody for a loan. Another option is to put financials in the beginning from stage one where you decide to write a book. Start setting aside money until you're ready for that editor. Then hopefully you've compiled enough to pay for that editor. Yeah, so pre-plan your editing right from day one. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is you decide to do will only help make your story better. That will only help you see a return on your investment. And as for uh, self-editing, you always want to send it to somebody, you know, even before an editor. Just just get somebody you trust to, to see what they, they think. But you cannot rely on the friends and family plan. This is where you ask Uncle Bob to read your story and let you know what he thought. Of course he loved it because he loves you. You could do no wrong with Uncle Bob. But what about your best friend Stacy? She had the same thought. It's the same trap. Stacy's afraid to hurt your feelings and wants to be encouraging. She does not edit professionally and therefore does not know how to go about steering you and your work down the proper path. And then there's the self-edit. You already know what you wrote. You know the words, you know the meaning, you know the entire story. You know the character, his best friend, his best friend's friend, and his best friend's friend's history too. It's all in there. Truthfully, it is all there in the story you wrote. But some of it may have missed the keyboard or the notepad. Every author needs a fresh, unattached set of eyes to view their work, because that is the work your fans will read. Again, you not only write for yourself, you have fans and other people who will see your work. Don't look at an editor as an added cost. Look at an editor as an investment. Once you and your editor are satisfied with your book, there are still things to consider. What if you had written some potentially troublesome content? Should you warn your readers? Early on in the show, we spoke to Carmilla Voyez, author of Broken Mirror and other morbid tales, about her use of trigger warnings in her work. What made you decide to go with individual trigger warnings over like a blanket warning in the beginning of the book? There are a lot of different but potentially triggering subjects in the book. And due to the nature of PTSD, not everyone who survives a trauma will have the same trigger. One reader who reviewed the book said they skipped a single tale because of the trigger warning but enjoyed the other 12. An overarching trigger warning would have not made this possible. 
I don't see trigger warnings as spoilers, but I apologise to anyone who might. Do you feel that trigger warnings have hindered book sales or kept people from reading the book just in general? Well, <laughs> writing a horror genre rather than romance hinders book sales. I write stories in the hope that people will enjoy them about subjects that fascinate me. I'm not driven by money, or I would have switched genres. The trigger warnings might have had an effect on sales, but who knows whether they increased or decreased interest. Do you think people from different places have different ideas on what needs a warning label and what doesn't? For example, would something you, living in Scotland, feel could use a warning be different than what I here in New York think needs one, and vice versa? I doubt it, unless a particular area has been hit by a disaster or war. I think most experiences cross geographical borders. If you're referring to the trigger warning for herbal tea at the start of Jagged Jaws, that was self-deprecating humour, which seems to have missed the target. Do you have any final thoughts about trigger warnings or warning labels in general? Is there anything that you would like our readers or other authors to know in using labels such a way? Well, since writing and editing Broken Mirror, the trend seems to have moved away from trigger warnings to and using content warnings. I suspect it's because the meaning of the word trigger has been warped and it's come to mean mild discomfort rather than the causing of the reliving of a traumatic event. But I use them for two main reasons. One, I had read and watched some material which had caused me significant emotional distress as I recorded trauma from my teens. And this resulted in a period of depression and I had to work hard to overcome. Second, I'd also read articles by others asking for writers and filmmakers to provide trigger warnings. I figure that if you're going to take advantage of the freedom to write on any subject, you should take responsibility for any harm you could cause. Trigger warnings are an effective way to minimise harm and enable survivors to practice self-care. And they cost nothing, really. I don't even think they cost me any book sales. We here at In The Beginning hope all of these author interviews help you along your writing journey. Tune in next week when we return with Brandy Ange's young adult contemporary fantasy, Transgression. And now, for the first time on In The Beginning, please enjoy our first featured indie song, Running With The Wolves by Alto Key.
I really hope you enjoyed that song. I know I did. We can't wait to bring you more. I am your host, Benjamin Frankie, asking everyone to read more books, be the best possible you, and to simply enjoy this wonderful life. Thanks for listening. <laughs>